from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common, and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals, taking together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Please be seated. Mark your song books for number 283 for the invitation song, 283. I sometimes kid with various ladies of the congregation because they are always after me to watch my diet, knowing that I'm diabetic and that I'm probably, what, five, six pounds overweight, something like that. I've made the comment several times that I got more wives than Solomon ever thought about having because I got everybody trying to take care of me, and I do appreciate that. And ladies, I want you to know that the men are trying to do their part too because Mark's younger than I am, and Scott is younger than I am, and Vince is certainly younger than I am, but they had me going up and down the stairs, going to the nursery <laughs> as far as serving the emblems to Sister Tanya is down there with her little one. So they're doing their part too. I think they probably decided that I needed to get a little exercise this morning. All it did was just kind of wind me a little bit, to tell you the truth. I have been given an announcement, and I did mention, uh, fail to mention that Sister Pam Witt is out of town as well, and that's the reason why Pamela is not with us this morning. But I was given an announcement uh, after I had made the announcements that Brother Jeremy DeHutt uh, we need to keep him and his family in our prayers uh, because uh, their son is uh, not doing well and uh, they have been told that very likely he does not have much longer to live. So we need to keep the DeHutt family in, in our daily prayers uh, in regard to this very, very difficult time. I'd like to start out this morning by just simply asking a question, and that question is, are you glad and excited about being a Christian? Because we certainly should be, shouldn't we? In the last two months, I have presented a series of lessons, seven different sermons, concerning the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, during that period of time, we also had our winter lectureship in which we had three different speakers come and speak to us in regard to the majesty of God and why we should stand in awe and reverence and give Him utmost respect and certainly not only in our daily lives but perhaps especially when we come together as His children to worship Him, that we worship Him in spirit and in truth and that we worship Him from the heart 
And that we worship Him in such a way that He deserves because He is indeed the God of creation. He spoke creation into existence. And it is Him in Him that we live and move and have our very being. The very breath of life comes from Him. And each and every day then we need to bow before Him in recognition of the fact that He is the great Creator and that we are His creation and that we are utterly and totally dependent upon Him. But not only that, but God has done so many things in blessing us and He has made so many wonderful <laughs> provisions for us that surely as His children, as His chosen ones, that we can be a people that are filled with gladness and that we are excited about being His children. I think I have mentioned in other sermons that my favorite hymn is the hymn Amazing Grace. It's a very special hymn to me because the grace of God and His forgiveness is just something that uh, is very, very important to me. I love all the verses of that song, and uh, perhaps you're not aware of it, but there are actually eight verses to the hymn Amazing Grace. My Actually, my favorite verse, which I will mention in just a moment, was a verse that the man who wrote this song actually did not write that particular verse. But one of the verses of that hymn is, It was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. And to me, as I think about that, that is certainly a reason to be filled with gladness and filled with excitement, the idea that as I read in the scriptures about this God who is this amazing God, but who is a God of wrath, who is a God of justice, a God of judgment, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, but He is a God of love and mercy. He taught me to fear the consequences of sin, and then He turned right around and taught me how to be feel, uh, free from the fear of the consequences of those sin by his son taking those sins away. Bearing them upon himself on the cross of Calvary so that God could look down upon me in favor. And then that verse that I said a moment ago is my absolute favorite verse, the one that, uh, that was not written by the uh, author of this song. And that is when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Now, if that doesn't excite you, folks, then maybe we ought to call Boken Funeral Home down here because you've got to be dead. If that idea of eternity, and you know, we, we talk about spending eternity, and we talk about all eternity, and neither one of those adjectives are appropriate because you cannot spend eternity, and there is no such thing as all of eternity. There's just eternity forever and ever and ever. And the idea of forever and ever and ever looking upon the glory of God, the majesty of God, and that incredible Savior who outshone the new day sun as he appeared to Saul of Tarsus, well, if that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't give you chill bumps, and it just did. But if it doesn't, there's something terribly, terribly wrong. Something terribly, terribly wrong. And that kind of gladness should indeed cause us to have a wonderful excitement. The word glad, first of all, is defined by uh, Vine in his expository dictionary of New Testament words as jubilant exultation, exuberant joy. And I think that as you... Think about what Christ has done for us. And as you sing songs like Amazing Grace, when you sing songs, Tom, thank you for leading He Lives because that's one of my favorite. I think maybe after Amazing Grace that might be my next most favorite song because I just love those last few words. He lives within my heart. And there's a certain excitement about that that just as... We talk about here, as far as the definition, exuberant joy, because exuberant joy lends itself to the idea that it's just something you can't contain. It's just something that you can't hold back. It's just something that's got to come out. It's got to be expressed in some way or another. 
You've just got to come out with a praise God, a hearty amen, or thank you, Lord, or something. But the idea that Jesus lives within us through faith, that He is our risen Savior, that we're saved by His life, that we're free from sin because the Son of God loves us so very much. That should be the source of exuberant joy. And that kind of joy certainly should lend itself to excitement. To increase the energy of, to produce increased activity. And I think about when we first got the news from Amber and Rob that they had been chosen as adoptive parents. And I want to tell you, I couldn't sit still. And when we got the news the second time that they were going to be adoptive parents, again, couldn't sit still. Gene and I went on a shopping spree like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> I mean, we went to the, what was it, Babies R Us, wasn't it? We went to the Babies R Us store and Amber and Rob got a, got a basket out and they started and I said, wait a minute. And I told Gene, I said, Gene, you get a basket, and I got a basket, and we went through that store with three shopping carts, and I want to tell you, we were just, <laughs> we were piling stuff in there, and I want to tell you, that little fella, even though he wasn't in our lives just yet, but he was well taken care of already. And that's because we were so excited about we're going to be grandparents again. And we're going to have this wonderful bundle of joy. Now two bundles of joy come into our lives. And I want to tell you, it produced increased activity, <laughs> for sure. Not quite as much as the increased activity that is present now that they're here. <laughs> because that's even more so. But we were so glad and we so excited about these two wonderful little fellows coming into our lives. And then verse of scripture, the passage of scripture that was read for us by Brother Mario just a moment ago, you see that, that excitement and you see that gladness in those first Christians, don't you? When you read Acts chapter 2, and the word gladness is even found there in the text of that passage of scripture that Mario read for us just a moment ago. And I believe that as you look closely at the verses of scripture that were read just a few minutes ago, what you're going to see there are you're going to see people who are filled with gladness and people who were absolutely exuberant with joy, so much so that they were so excited that it produced a very marked increase in the activity that was going on there among them. And sometimes, unfortunately, I have to admit, I don't see that in my brethren today. David wrote in the 122nd Psalm, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And sometimes when we come together to worship God in the assembly, and I ask folks, how are you doing today? And sometimes the answer is, oh man, I'm just really tired. And sometimes, and maybe jokingly, I hear, you better preach loud today because I'm liable to go to sleep. And hopefully they don't really mean that. But brethren, if there is anything on the face of this earth that should cause us to be glad, to be filled with exuberant joy, to be so excited that we have an increase in our energy, it should be coming here in the presence of God to offer the God of heaven and earth our very best worship and our very best praise. I know that y'all saw similar pictures to this in Brother Dan Starr's presentation during the, the uh, winter lectureship when he was talking about the majesty of God. But in this first one up here, this is the earth and it's showing you the relative size of earth with the smaller planets. And the earth, of course, is the biggest one in that frame. But over here, when you look at earth and you compare it over here to to Jupiter, then Earth isn't so big anymore, is it? But then on the other hand, when you compare Jupiter to our sun, Jupiter's not very big, but when you compare our sun to the star Sirius, which is the nearest star and the brightest star to us, our sun's not very big compared to Sirius, but when you compare Sirius 
to this particular star. It's not very big. And when you compare that star to the star of Betelgeuse, it's, and on and on and on and on it goes. And I sometimes see pictures like this, and I wonder what's the biggest one and how big is it. But you know what? It makes no difference because however big it might be and however big the cosmos might be, it is itty bitty tiny compared to our God. Because all he had to do is say, let there be. And they all came into existence just like that. Now that's exciting. That's exciting. That, that should just increase our pulse rate. Just thinking about how wonderful and how majestic and how big and how powerful and how omniscient our God is because he created all of those things and he's got every one of them out there working in concert with one another. Perfect order in God's universe and such perfect order that NASA scientists can look at the order of the universe and they can tell us when certain comets or certain things in the universe that we are familiar with are going to come into view. Halley's Comet that only comes around every 70 years and unfortunately it's not going to come around again in my lifetime. But they can tell us exactly when it's going to be able to be seen in this part of the world. And they can tell us and have told us that the next time that we, you and I, here in the mid upper Midwestern part of the United States, are going to be able to observe a, a complete solar eclipse is August of the year 2018. And the only reason why they can tell us those kinds of things with that kind of precision is because of the precision, the greatness, the majesty, the control, the sovereign rule of our God. That we are here this morning, we're right now, in, a, in his presence, in a way, Brother Starr pointed it out, Brother Russell pointed it out, Brother Jerry Cleek pointed it out. We are here this morning in the presence of God in a way that we're not ever in his presence outside this assembly. It is. It is, ladies and gentlemen, truly holy ground. Holy ground in the sense that we are here in the presence of God in a very, very special way. And we are here to be excited about this God that we love, that we worship, and that we praise, and that we serve. And we need to be excited about that. And you know, sometimes in the providence of God, it really amazes me how things work out sometimes. In our Bible class here in the auditorium this morning, we began the Bible class talking about, from the passage of Scripture, and a few passages after that, about this wondrous wonderful relationship that those early Christians had with God and how they expressed that relationship, the gladness that they had, that they demonstrated. And then in the middle of that class, and I took the opportunity to write it down, Brother Joel Fields made a comment, and the very last thing that he said in that comment was, seems like this was an exciting time. And I'm sure it was. And today is a very exciting time. We need to be truly excited. We need to be filled with the gladness. We need to be energized. We need to be exuberated. We need to be people that are just bubbling over. And it, it, it's sad to me when I see my brethren. And they sometimes look like they're going to a funeral. When in fact coming here should be the height of our week and certainly the very best day of the week. And being here a source of energy, a source of joy that is beyond description. Because we're here to worship our God. I want us to look this morning at three things that I believe those first century Christians that we read about there and when that we did read about a moment ago in Acts chapter 2, why they were people that were glad and why they were excited 
about being a Christian because whatever it made them happy, whatever made them glad, whatever excited them, whatever caused them to experience this exuberant joy should be the same reason for you and I to experience those same things today. I began by saying that they had been forgiven of having crucified Jesus, the Son of God. Does that, does that excite you personally? Does that fill you with a joy unspeakable? And maybe one of the reasons that it doesn't, as it should, is because we're removed from the fact of the event by some 2,000 years. On the other hand, how often do you take time to sit and contemplate that your sin crucified Jesus, the Son of God? That your guilt before God was just as much a part of the crucifixion of Jesus as those who stood there before Pilate and cried out, crucify him, crucify him. There's a song in our songbook, and I would ask you to get your songbooks and turn to it. At, at first, I was thinking about singing it. My voice is not uh, uh, singing it together. My voice is not all that strong, but number 346, we'll just read it together. <clears throat> it's a beautiful, beautiful song, and a song that I'm sure that we're familiar with. We don't sing it a whole lot, and I'm not really for sure why. I sing it every now and then when Satan is really tugging at my heart. And I sing this song to give me strength to help me keep from giving in. Shall I crucify my Savior when for me He bore such loss? Shall I put to shame my Savior? Can I nail Him to the cross? Our temptations, this is the verse that really gets me. And this is the verse that helps me, I think, the most. Are temptations so alluring? Do earth's pleasures so enthrall that I cannot love my Savior well enough to leave them all? Man, what a question. What a question to ask yourself in the hour of temptation when Satan is really after you and he's tugging really hard and he's just about to win the battle. Ask yourself this question. Can I love Jesus and what he did for me on the cross enough that I won't give in to this? Can, can I love God and his son Jesus enough to keep from just giving in because it's just a pleasure for an instant and then all the guilt sets in. Bad choice, bad trade-off. Twas my sins that crucified him. Shall they crucify him yet? Blackest day of nameless anguish, anguish can my thankless soul forget. Oh, the bloody or the kindly hands of Jesus, pouring blessings on all men, bleeding nail-scarred hands of Jesus. Can I nail them once again? Shall I crucify my Savior, crucify my Lord again? Once, oh once, I crucified him. Shall I crucify again? You ever experienced just an incredible sense of relief? I, I don't even remember how we it came into the conversation yesterday, I believe it was. But I made a comment how that, I think there was a commercial on television, but at any rate, I made comment that the antacid tablet that has always worked best for me, which is Rolaids, were taken off the shelves of stores and supermarkets and, and pharmacies a couple of years ago, and I guess since they haven't reappeared in that two-year period of time that they're gone. I don't know. But I said, I, you know, Rolaids are just no longer available and Amber taking after her daddy my wonderful sense of humor she says well how are we going to spell relief now because that was the commercial wasn't it of Rolaids how do you spell relief R-O-L-A-I-D-S I, -I, -D -S. I thought she's, she's my little girl <laughs> have you ever felt really 
genuine relief. Now, Mark and I, we certainly have in our life because we've been robbed at gunpoint. And he and I have talked about it. And I want to tell you, they hit me in the head with that gun and split it wide open to where I needed six stitches, but that's better than getting shot. I'll tell you that right now. So Mark and I know what real relief is all about. Do you? Do you really know? Have you ever experienced real relief? That word relief. And this girl looks like she needs something awfully bad. But the dictionary says relief is ease from anything that lessens fear, anxiety, or discomfort to lessen or alleviate anything that is oppressive or distressing. Is there anything that provides more stress, more discomfort than being guilty before God? If you haven't experienced genuine forgiveness and the relief from the guilt, not just the guilt of being a sinner, but carrying around that guilt, trying your very best to get rid of it. If you've experienced that, you've experienced something that should fill you with a world of joy. Because there's absolutely nothing in this world that's more important, that is better than being forgiven. It provides a freedom. It takes a weight off of your chest. It, it, it allows you to live. That's what it does. It allows you to live. And there's just nothing like forgiveness and the relief that comes from that. Not just feeling guilty, but the fact of guiltiness. I suspect that the Apostle Paul knew quite a bit about that. We, just this last Thursday morning, began our study in the life of the Apostle Paul. And isn't it an amazing thing that Paul was the one that God used to tell us more about grace than any other writer in the Word of God? I am confident that that's the reason for that is because Paul, who saw himself as the chief of sinners, understood forgiveness and relief as well as anybody that's ever walked this earth. Our first century brothers and sisters in Christ were people of gladness. And they were people who were excited because they, on the day of Pentecost, were told how they could get relief from being guilty of crucifying Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And it should provide the same gladness of heart and the same excitement in our lives today because we too crucified Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. And then I think the other thing is, is that they, they had this gladness and this, this increased energy of, uh, of doing things because they now had the opportunity to serve this man that they had hated so much. To serve the very Son of God rather than trying to persecute Him. We're not going to read the entire passage. I've just kind of emboldened and molded the various words that I wanted to. You remember the account Jesus was talking about judgment day, excuse me, judgment day here, and to those righteous ones who had faithfully served him, he said, well now, you know, I, on one, I, I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was a stranger, I was naked, I was sick, I was in prison, you visited me, and they said, well, when did we do all that? And he said, when you did it to one of these, the least of these, he says, you did it to me. But to those unrighteous, those people that he would consider to be those bad, unrighteous people. He said the same thing to them. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was sick, I was in prison, and so forth and so on. And you didn't come and visit me. And they said, well, now wait a minute. When did we not do that? Again, he brings it to their attention. When you didn't do it, to the least of these, my brother, it's the same as if you didn't do it for me. 
Uh, that's such an important passage of Scripture, I believe, because I believe that this passage of Scripture brings to our attention, okay, if Jesus was physically here upon this earth today, what would my attitude be towards serving Him, for doing things for Him? How far would I drive if Jesus needed a ride to the assembly? How far would I drive to pick Him up without complaint? As a matter of fact, to be thrilled to death, to look forward to the pleasure and the opportunity of have him ride with me to the assembly. How excited would I get? How excited would you get if Jesus were to come and sit down right beside you in your car because he needed a ride to the assembly? I think that all of us would probably want to say, you know, that would be a very joyful occasion. We have opportunities to serve our Lord by serving one another. We have a number of folks in this congregation that need help getting to the assembly. We have a number of folks in this congregation that just need help doing this, that, and the other. Some getting to the doctor, some of them you know, going to the grocery store maybe or whatever. Are we serving our Lord? Are we helping Him get to the grocery store? Are we helping Him get to the hospital? Are we helping, them, uh, helping Him get home from some place? We have these wonderful opportunities to serve the Son of God. And the excitement that comes from knowing that we have done so. You remember the discourse that, and the exchange that Jesus had with the woman of Samaria? And I know that at first you might not think, well, well what in the world has that got to do with what we're talking about here? But look, just look at what we read here. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the man, Come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And they went out of the city and were coming to him. You see, in that passage of scripture, I see a woman that's excited. I see someone who has spoke, spoken, even though she didn't recognize it at first, she has spoken with this promised Messiah that they were living in eager anticipation of. And when he says to her, I am that man. And he has proved it to her by the fact that he was able to tell her about her life story. <laughs> Something that he really didn't have the opportunity to do other than he had to be the Messiah. And she goes and she leaves her water pot. She doesn't even care about that. And she goes back into the city and she has the whole city there. Excited. In anticipation coming back and they wanted to see this fellow that perhaps could indeed be the Messiah. And I've made this point before, but the 12 apostles went in there, and I don't know how long they were there, but they didn't bring a single person back. But this woman did. She brought back practically the whole town. Now, how did she do that? How did she manage to accomplish that? I'll tell you how she did it. There was a gladness, there was an excitement, there was an exuberance in her, in her being. You could see it in her face, you could see it in her reactions, you could see it in the words that she spoke. And these people just couldn't, we have to go see for ourselves. Yeah, if we want folks to come, if we want folks to give attention to us when we ask them, will you like to study the Bible with us? They're going to have to see something in us that causes them to want to be like us. And what they really need to see, they need to see a people of gladness. They need to see a people's who have lives that are superior to anything that they've ever even experienced. And they're going to have to see an excitement in us about coming to worship God and to study God's Word. And they have to see a people who treasure this book more than life itself because this book contains the words of life. They need to see that. And those first century Christians were glad people. Because they were hearing about eternal life 
and this man Jesus whom they had crucified, the Messiah. I wonder if maybe we use that word Messiah more often in our conversations. Thinking about what that means, the anointed one, the chosen one. I could ask my students in my Wednesday night class about that and they would be able to tell you what that word Messiah was all about. Because we talked about that. I wonder if we started thinking about Jesus more in terms of him being the Messiah. The chosen one of God. The anointed one of God. And the only one who can take away our sins. The only one that can give us relief from the burden and the guiltiness of sin. Maybe we'd be a little bit more excited about him if we did that. And then finally this morning, they were family now. They were a family. You know, in, in the study that we just concluded concerning the 400 years of silence, one of the things that we talked about was how that the Jews, after they came back from being in captivity, and now they're back in Jerusalem and they've rebuilt the walls in the city to a certain extent in the, in the temple and whatever. But they were a nation of people still divided by the various sects of Jews that had risen up during that period of time. There were the, Fad the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Essenes and the Zealots and on and on and on. There were several of the different sects. of the, the, the world that Jesus came into was a world divided, even among his own brethren in the flesh. These folks on the day of Pentecost and thereafter, these were some really excited people. Because now they're no longer a divided people. Now they're a family, united together as one in Jesus Christ. Yesterday, Gene and Amber and Rob and the two boys and I went over to Joliet, Illinois. They had a fundraising auction there for the sacred selection group that helps Christians adopt children. They helped Amber and Rob adopt these two beautiful young boys here. And we were over there and we were hearing accounts of various ways and things that God had done uh, as far as helping families, all members of the body of Christ, all part of a faithful conservative church, all faithful Christians, and how God has helped them to get these beautiful, beautiful children so that they can raise them up to love God and to do His bidding. And there was one family there, I was telling Donna about it on the way to the building this morning. One family there that went to the Ukraine to adopt a young lady who was getting close to her 16th birthday who would be kicked out of the orphanage out on the streets subject to the sex traders and would live the rest of her life very likely, what, however long that might be and very likely not real long, would live in a life of prostitution, 16 years old. And so this family went to the Ukraine and adopted her. She was there yesterday, got to see this young lady, beautiful, beautiful young lady. And we heard about from the family that adopted her how that when they went to the Ukraine and they went to the orphanage where she was, what they heard from the other children, they didn't want money, they didn't want food, they didn't want clothing. They wanted a family. That's what they wanted. They wanted a family. Begging them, take me, take me, take me. Because they wanted a family. Family is pretty much lost in our society, isn't it? Used to be that when you talk about family, you talk about mom and dad and kids. And that's become somewhat fractured and shattered. And a lot of times the reason for that is because daddy's nowhere in the picture or maybe mommy is nowhere in the picture. But what we see here in Acts chapter 2 is family. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Just look at 
those words that are used about family together and all things in common, sharing with one mind together gladness and sincerity of heart because that's what our spiritual family is all about. That's what being a member of the body of Christ is all about, your family. And you're together with those of one mind and one heart, and we share. We talked about it in Chuck's Bible class this morning, that idea of Barnabas selling his, his a tract of land and giving the money to the apostles and Ananias and Sapphira, uh, maybe perhaps for ill motives, doing the same except holding back some of the money. And God saw the insincerity of their hearts and he struck them dead immediately because they tried to lie to him. But the fact of the matter is that these brethren, one of the reasons why they were willing to share with one another is because they were family. Part of one another. Isn't it interesting, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, Paul in writing to the church at Ephesus as we have been studying on Sunday nights about how we are to go about conducting our lives knowing what Christ has done for us and what God has done. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have to share with one who has need. We're all familiar with that verse of Scripture, aren't we? Sure. How many times do we emphasize, though, that last phrase, so that he will have to share with one who has need? need how many times and I'm guilty so don't think that I'm pointing fingers at all y'all I'm not just asking the question how many times have you ever gone to work thinking I'm going to get to go to work today and I'm going to get to earn some money so that I can help somebody else so I can give it to somebody else or I can buy something that somebody else needs. How many times have you ever gone to work thinking I'm going to work with my hands performing what is good so that I will have something to share with one who has need? And that seems to me the fundamental, basic, underlying reason why as family, we can have such joy as knowing that when we have need, our brothers and sisters are going to be there as a part and as an extension of God's hand, fulfilling his promise to provide the necessities of life. And you know why? Because we're family. Doesn't it put a smile on your face? Doesn't it fill your heart? with joy because it should because we're family our big brother died for us and our father sent him to die for us so that we can be brothers and sisters and love one another and take care of one another we get excited about a lot of stuff we have been watching some of the basketball games I've tolerated that for Rob's sake because he's, he's a big basketball fan. I made the ultimate sacrifice. Tiger Woods in the lead in the current, Bible, uh, uh, current golf tournament. I haven't watched it. I've watched basketball. <laughs> but there was a game on last evening, the Butler-Marquette game, that was indeed a very exciting game, and it was not determined until the last 2.9 seconds of the game. It was exciting. It really was. But brethren, if anything excites us more than being a child of God, there's something desperately, desperately, desperately wrong. There's nothing more exciting than that. There's nothing more exciting than being forgiven. There's nothing more exciting than walking in newness of life with hope of eternal life. And it's yours this morning. We're offering it yours this morning. All you have to do is just take the grace of God given in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in your faith, confess Him as God's Son, the Christ, your only hope of heaven, in repentance of your sin, let Him be the Lord and Master of your life, 
be buried with him in baptism so that you can walk in newness of life, excited and filled with joy and gladness because now you have the relief, freedom from the burden of your sin. We offer it to you right now. All together we stand and sing. There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by, when the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to